All right, cool. There's me and my slides. All right. Uh, hey, everybody. I'm, uh, as Abbas said, I'm Jim Hester. I'm a software engineer at RStudio on the Tidyverse team. And uh, my talk today is going to be about the, C the CPP11 package, which aims to let you weld R and C++ together. So the first thing, um, if you're not familiar with C++, a very quick overview. It's a very fast language. Um, it's been around for a long time since the early 80s. Um, so there's lots of libraries built in um, to the ecosystem already. It's a statically typed language, which gives you a little bit more safety than dynamically typed languages like R. Um, but it, while it has all of these advantages, it has a very limited safety net. So there's a lot of errors that you can um, cause in C++ code that are basically impossible to, to do in, in just regular R code, like a, with a managed um, garbage collector. For instance, um, dangling pointers or memory leaks or out of bounds um, array accesses are all impossible to do in R, but, um, but definitely possible to do in C++. So if you've ever looked into using C++ and R before, you may have heard of the RCPP package. So this is, I would say, one of the most um, successful packages in the R ecosystem. So this graph is showing the, the percentage of packages using RCPP as a percentage of the entire, of all the packages on CRAN. So it was um, first developed around 2010, and you can see now um, in 2020, um, over 10% of all of CRAN is using RCPP as a package. So this is over 2,000 packages that are using RCPP now. So that's like a huge, that's like one of the most successful packages in, in the R ecosystem, I would say. So after saying that, why in the world would I make a new package to do the, basically the same thing that R, R, RCPP is doing? So um, having all those packages packages depend on RCPP is really a blessing, but it also can be a curse because uh, that means that you can't break compatibility with your, your, your existing APIs because then all of those packages would have to change. So one of the primary driving reasons um, for creating the CPP11 package is that um, we wanted to make some breaking changes that would be basically impossible to do um, using RCPP because too many packages would have to change in order to do so. So I'm going to talk about some, some of the four main reasons that uh, I wanted, uh, that we wanted to create the CPP11 package. But first, I wanted to go through a few um, more minor features that CPP11 gives you. So this is, you can say, the lightning round of, of the talk. So the first thing, as you might guess from the, from the title of, um, of the package, uh, CPP11 gives you access to C++11. So C++11 was a major um, change in the, the language specification of C++. People sometimes think of it as a completely new language. Yeah, so, much, so many things changed. Um, maybe the most important of which is um, so-called move semantics, which lets you move an object from one um, location to another without having to copy it. Um, uh, the other big change is, is automatic type deduction in some cases, uh, and also um, using smart pointers um, with the uh, smart auto pointers. Um, and then other things that the CPP11 package uses from C++11 are type traits, initializer list, variadic templates, user-defined literals, and user-defined attributes. So the CPP11 package is really trying to take advantage of all of the features that C++11 provides. And what's more, because you're if you're using CPP11, you, you basically have to use C++11. The C++ code in your package can also take advantage of all these features. And this often can avoid the need for heavy um, dependencies, such as the BH package, which can provide some of these features without C++11. So another thing that CPP11 gives us is a, simple, a much simpler implementation compared to RCPP. So as I said, RCPP was written in 2010, and it's had basically uh, 10 years of, of development to add new features 
and um, and handle all of the edge cases that people have come up with. And as a result, um, the amount of code within RCPP is, is orders of, like an order of magnitude more than than what's in CPP 11. So there's over 74,000 lines of code, and this is taking out comments and white space and everything in RCPP and there's only, there's less than 2000 lines of code in CPP 11. So it's much, much simpler. Of course, that simplicity comes at a bit of a cost, of course, because we don't have all of the features in CPP 11 that RCPP does. So there's there's no modules, there's no of the, the sugar syntax um, that RCPP provides. There's less um, features in the attributes. Um, we don't have any no, automatic number, no, random number restoration. We don't support the Roxygen comments in your C++ code, and we don't do anything um, with in the interface um, feature of the attributes. So this is definitely true that CPP 11 doesn't have all of the features in RCPP, but uh, we wrote it so that it would have all the features that we typically rely on in, in our packages. So because it's the, the implementation is so much simpler, that also lets us have much cheaper compilation time, both in um, time and in, in memory usage during compilation. So these are four packages that I um, converted from RCPP to using CPP 11. And you can see the difference in the, both the compilation time and the memory use. And basically the only change here uh, between these two versions was, was changing from RCPP to CPP 11. Um, there were no other additional changes. So clearly, um, this simpler Im implementation lets the compiler compile your code quite a bit faster and makes your package lighter as a result. So another thing um, that CPP gives you is that it's completely header only. So this, what this means is uh, all the code is in, in header files in, that, you, that you include in your, um, so in your object files. And because it's header only, this means that you can't have um, so-called ABI conflicts. So if you install a package that's using RCPP with a specific version, and then you later um, upgrade your version of, of RCPP, if, if those two versions of RCPP happen to have different application binary interfaces, then if you re try to reload your package later on, it will seg fault because it's trying to look at, um, it's trying to look in the RCPP um, source library in the wrong location and it will crash R. And this actually has happened um, in practice before. You might think this is just an academic issue, but this has actually happened to people. Um, so there was an old dplyr issue where, where this occurred. Um, so the RCPP developers try pretty hard to avoid um, these ABI conflicts, but they're often sometimes hard or impossible to, to do, to avoid. So because CPP 11 is a header only package, we, we avoid this problem completely because you don't have a shared library to worry about. Another thing that allows you to sort of isolate changes in CPP 11 is that it's, it's vendorable. So a lot like a street vendor who can move from place to place, you can, or can bring your food to you, you can bring CPP 11 to your package. So this will actually embed um, the CPP 11 headers in your package code. And that ensures that it won't change unless you, you explicitly update it um, yourself by, by calling the CPP vendor function. And so this function just basically copies the, the files from um, the CPP desk distribution to your, your package and then adds some comments so you, so you know which version of CPP 11 um, it was copied from. And this has the drawback that you might miss out on um, any features or bug fixes in, that happen in CPP 11 until you update itself, yourself. But this also ensures that any changes that we, we make in CPP 11 won't break your package because it's only going to update when you explicitly do so. So another feature that CPP 11 gives us is a much lower and much more consistent protection cost. So one of the things that RCPP and CPP 11 provide is automatic protection of, our, of objects from R's garbage collector. The, the drawback of the implementation in RCPP 
is that because it uses a, a linear list to store the objects being protected, um, every if if that list gets long enough, it has to search through the entire list each time uh, a, an object is protected or unprotected. And if this gets big enough, that um, that time, extra time, can can dominate the entire uh, runtime of your program. So most of the time, this isn't a problem in practice because most RCPP um, programs are only protecting a, a handful of objects at a time. But if you have a catastrophic case where you're protecting uh, hundreds of thousands of objects, you can see this really starts to add up and be a problem. So CPP11 uses a different um, data structure underneath, a double link list. And this allows us to have constant time insertion and removal of, of objects from our list, from our protection um, list. And that means that regardless of how many objects we're protecting, we always get the same cost to unprotect or protect a, a given object. Um, another thing that is differs from CPP11 and RCPP is the, the behavior when you're growing a vector um, element by element. So this is a plot of, of repeatedly adding a new, um, a new data element to, to a vector. And the x-axis is the, the number of elements we're adding. The y-axis is the total time to do so. So the way our, you might not realize this, but RCPP, when you're every time you append to a vector, it actually copies the entire vector over to a, a, a new section of memory. So if you add a thousand elements to a, to a vector using RCPP, it's going to copy the entire vector a thousand times. Um, CPP11 uses a different strategy. It allocates a larger block of memory, and so if so, and then only copies when that, that larger block of memory has been filled. And this means that if you're adding a thousand um, elements, you maybe only have to copy your vector 10 times. So as a result, we're able to, um, in the same amount of time, we're able to add over um, 10 million, 10 or 20, 2 million elements in about the same time that you can add 10,000 elements using RCPP. And this is um, also something that people might not in intuitively expect RCPP to, to be doing because the, the regular um, vectors, C++, C++, C++ vectors in the standard library have basically the same behavior as CPP11 does. They allocate an additional amount of memory. So, so repeatedly appending to a vector isn't terribly costly in C++. And if you expect um, the RCPP vectors to behave the same way, you'll be surprised by the runtime performance of your code. So those are sort of the more minor features of CPP11. Now, um, for the rest of my talk, I want to talk about sort of the four major reasons that we, that we wrote this package. And those four reasons are um, ensuring correct semantics for your, for your functions, Two, um, memory safety and resource safety. Three, um, Unicode support and Unicode awareness, I would say. And finally, um, support for alt rep vectors, which are being used more and more in, in R today. So the first thing I'm going to go through is the semantics. So the, in the R language definition, it says the semantics of invoking a function in R, an R argument are call by value. Changing the value of a supplied argument within a function will not affect the value of the variable in the calling frame. So I'm sure if you've used R for any length of time, you, you intuitively understand what this means. So if you have a function and within that function, you change one of the arguments, that change within the function doesn't affect the argument's value outside of the function. And so we'll go through an explicit example just to show this. So the, this, this function is simply um, taking a vector and then summing all the vector, the values in the vector and returning the sum. <coughs> so this is a very simple read-only um, function. And we can, we can um, create the same function using RCPP like this. And you can see that the, the logic of this function is basically identical between uh, R and C++. 
But if, and then if we try to use these functions, we see we get exactly the same behavior because both of these, this is a read only function and, and they're basically working um, by call by value. So we get six for the answer and our original, um, our original data has not changed. It's still one, two, three in both cases. How if we now, if we now take a function where we changed the value of our code in this add first function, we're just adding one to the first element in our vector and then returning the changed vector. And then we can do the same thing in RCPP. Again, you see that the logic is basically identical. The only difference being that um, R is a one, uses one based um, indexes and, and C++ uses zero based indexes. But other than that, the logic is identical. So is this code called by value? If you know C++ at all, um, you might think it is because um, the integer vector type doesn't have an ampersand next to it, which in C++ would typically indicate a call by reference. So this looks like call by value, but is it actually? So if we try this, um, the, R, the R function returns two, two, three, because we, we updated the value of X within the function. But then if we, if we inspect the, the value of X outside of the function, we see it is still the original data one, two, three. However, if you look at the C, uh, RCPP implementation of this, you see that both the function return value and the, um, the original data have been changed. So this is actually called by reference. So what is going on? So what's going on is actually this integer vector um, object can basically be, is basically internally represented as, as a pointer in, to the, the, the R vector data. And because pointers, when you pass them by, by value, simply copy the address that they're pointing to, they're sort of implicitly always called by reference. So because of this, um, all of the integer, all of the vector classes in RCPP are called by reference and have these completely different semantics from a normal R function. So this is really an instance of the pinnacle of success. So if you realize that RCPP has this behavior by default and don't want your function to have this behavior, you can explicitly um, copy your data before you make any modifications. But that's definitely not the default. So if you know, have all this background knowledge and know exactly what you need to do to do the right thing, you can have be successful. And maybe you're really excited that I, I learned all these things and I've done it, but that's not what we want. Really, we want the pit of success. So rather than a pinnacle we have to strive to reach, we want a pit that we can just like get sucked into. So if you're like standing here on this rock above my head, you just get swiped right into the pit and you just, by default, the, the thing that you were trying to do just happens. So what does the pit of success look like in this case? So we can define these two functions with using CPP 11 in, in exactly the same way. But the, the one thing you might notice is that we're using uh, integers here and down below we're using writable integers. So what's the difference between these two um, classes? So the regular integers class is a read only view of the, of the R, R data. So that uses basically the same um, pointer that the C RCPP does. And so that gives you the same performance uh, like that RCPP would give you in those in read only cases. The writable integer will actually copy the data before um, you, you make any changes to it. So in this case, it will it'll do the copy for you and then you can make your change to your, your vector and it will return the copied vector. So what happens if you try to, cop, try to modify this read-only integer? You'll get a, um, a compile time error. So this, this API is, it, it'll say that it, the expression is not assignable because you can't assign to a read-only vector. So this API ensures that you you cannot make you cannot um, modify the, the original um, data, but also preserves the performance characteristics we're looking for. And we can just see that this this code now works like we were expecting it to. We get um, call by value semantics in both cases, 
both the read-only case and the, uh, the, the case where we're modifying the data. Our original um, value of our vector has not changed. So the second um, big idea is, is related to resource safety. So you may have heard of um, a resource leak or a memory leak when you're dealing with um, compiled code like C++. And what this is, is when your, your program is, has a pointer to a, a location in memory or a file handle or other resource. And then at some point in the program's execution, it loses, um, the pointer is, is destroyed and you lose the, without um, releasing the resource back to the operating system. And that causes the resource to leak. So you can think of the operating system as, as a pool of resources. And if something leaks out of the pool, that means that the rest of your processes can no longer use that resource. So how does this look in practice? So if this is a function, uh, a C++ function, does this function have a memory leak? So we're, we're creating a, a standard string object. And then at some point in our execution, let's say there's a bunch of other code in here and then it, it, it it throws an error, an R error. And this does have a memory leak. So maybe it's more explicit to see this in C rather than C++. So inside the standard string um, constructor, it basically allocates memory on the, the heap, the memory heap using malloc or a similar idea. And then in the destructor of the, of the object, it will call free to release that memory back into the operating system. However, if this error happens in the middle, the free um, call can never happen. And so that memory leaks and then won't be captured back by the operating system until your R process ends. And because R process, processes are often fairly long lived, these memory leaks can really add up and cause problems in your, in your code. So the way that C++ historically deals with memory leaks is by not throwing um, long jump errors like is done in C and in, in R's API, but instead throwing C++ exceptions. And the nice thing about C++ exceptions is that any, dis any um, object, C++ objects on the call stack, when the exception is thrown, their destructors automatically are, are, are run. And so, the memory that those objects are, are holding is automatically released back to the system. And so this ensures that you don't get memory leaks even in the presence of errors. So RCPP basically has the same problem. So, um, so you might not think there's any error happening here. How could this code possibly error? All we're doing is creating a, a string and then returning it back to R. How could, this error, how could this code ever have an error? So if we look at what the equivalent C code for this would be, it we're still creating the string. And then RCPP is basically have these next two lines of C code internally in, in it. So it's allocating a, a string uh, um, vector and then assigning, uh, alloc doing another allocation for the, the actual um, string data and then assigning that data to the vector. And it turns out that anytime you allocate memory in R, that allocation can fail and throw an error. So both the alloc, alloc vector call and this make car call could, could throw an error. And if either of those um, functions errors, this code would have a memory leak. So basically you, a good rule of thumb is that any call to an R API function can potentially error. So anytime you're calling R, R's API, you, that if things go wrong, um, that call could error and then cause a memory leak for any object that's on the C++ stack at the time of the error. So what is the pit of success for this? This is a different kind of pit, but um, so CPP 11 gives us two tools um, to protect against this. And the way these tools work is they intercept the, if an, if an error happens in R's API, they intercept the error and then convert it to a C++ exception and throw that exception. 
And the C, because we're throwing a C++ exception, any C++ objects on our call stack will have their destructors called and the memory um, released back to the operating system. So the first tool is called un this unwind protect function. And this, this gives you, this um, lets you pass a, a Lambda function to it. And then any C code within that, that um, Lambda function that has an error will be automatically protected and have this C++ exception thrown. So this code does not have any memory leaks. If, if either of these alloc vector or make car um, functions throw an error, we'll be protected from that. The other um, tool is CPP11 safe. And basically this is syntactic sugar for the unwind protect function I showed first. Um, this will basically wrap any R API function in unwind protect for you. And then you can call it just like you would a normal function. So this gives us a nice little syntax for easily ensuring our memory is safe or our, our, our calls are safe. So the third um, big idea is um, Unicode awareness and Unicode support. So if you're just dealing, if most of your code is dealing with ASCII data, or even if it's dealing with um, Latin style European languages, you may not run, run into many Unicode problems. But if you start dealing with more A, um, Asian languages or more esoteric um, languages that aren't well encoded in, um, in, the, in the code pages on Windows, you, you will definitely start running into Unicode problems. And often people who are not Windows developers wonder what's all, all the issue is here. If you're using Mac OS, or Linux, typically your, your system is running in a UTF-8 locale. And if everything is running in UTF-8, um, you really don't have many problems because you can just deal with UTF-8 throughout your program and everything sort of just works. But if you then try to, and often package developers are, are not using Windows and then are confused when their, their users reporting all of these Unicode problems that they can't reproduce on their systems. So this is, as a package developer, this is like a huge frustration um, because because people clearly are having problems, but it's really hard. You have to like get a, either get a VM to, to get to use Windows or get a new PC to, to check your, your Windows code. So it's a, or try to do it on like a CI system. It's a huge pain. So how do we, so it'd be great to, uh, and in addition, um, getting Unicode right is really hard. So this is another example of sort of the pinnacle of success where you know, if you do everything perfectly right all the way up to the pinnacle, um, it will work. But if you don't do everything perfectly right, every, every time you're dealing with character data, it just like blows up and, and it goes wrong. And, and it, this is really hard to do. You can tell it's really hard because even the R core developers have problems with this. So this is, um, there's a bunch of issues open right now for getting Unicode right um, in R itself. So if, if the code within R is doing this wrong, how is the package developer ever gonna do this correctly? Um, and of course, we in the Tidyverse and, and Rlib organizations also have plenty of Unicode problems that people report. And there's lots of um, um, issues that people or questions about Unicode and encodings with R on both um, Stack Overflow and in the R Studio community. So clearly, um, we are not all achieving this, this pinnacle of success. And just to illustrate that these problems are very easy to, to cause, um, here's very, basically the simplest RCBP um, function I can write. It's taking a standard string and returning a, a, the exact same string. It's doing absolutely nothing to the string. All it's doing is taking the data from R and returning it back to R. And if we create a, a, this, a simple um, character vector fast, facile and given a Latin one encoding, 
and then pass this to RCPP. And I should mention this is, if you do this on Windows, you'll, you'll see this behavior. If you do this same thing on Mac OS, you won't see this behavior because Mac OS is using a UTF-8 locale, whereas Windows by default is using a Latin 1 locale. So if you do this with a Latin 1 input, it, everything looks fine. You get facile, it looks nice. Um, but if you do this with UTF-8 input, so this, I'm not explicitly setting the, the encoding to UTF-8 here, but because I'm using this escape, this is, um, R automatically will set the encoding to be UTF-8. And then I pass this, this object to my RCBP function. I get um, just garbage back. So what, what happened here? So the problem is that R, um, RCPP is not marking, the, the data hasn't actually changed here, but RCPP isn't marking this, this string that it returns as UTF-8 encoding. So R is interpreting it in the, in the normal um, Latin 1 locale, in the default Latin 1 locale for Windows. And because of this, we get um, corrupted data. So what is the fire pit of success for this? Uh, so there's a site called utf8everywhere.org. And what this site uh, proposes is that UTF-8 should be the default choice of encoding for storing text strings in memory or on disk for communication and for all other uses. And doing this would provide improved performance, reduce complexity of software, and help prevent many Unicode related bugs. And so this, what this philosophy is basically saying is that only you should only deal with um, these alternative encodings like UTF-16 on the edges of your program. And then anywhere in the middle of your program should be strictly UTF-8 in, in the internals. And, and you should only wor worry about converting between any encodings on the edges of your programs. So what this means for CPP-11 is that any text coming from R is always translated into UTF-8 before you can use it in C++. And that any um, text that's coming from a C++ library is always marked as UTF-8 before you pass it to R. And, be, and, and as, as long as we um, always do this on the edges of our interfaces of the program, we can ensure that we get um, proper, U, proper Unicode support um, throughout our program, as long as all of the internals are dealing with code in UTF-8. I should mention that most modern C++ libraries also take this philosophy. So they're usually going to give you UTF-8 uh, encoding anyway. So this really fits well um, when you're interfacing with C++ libraries. So how does this look with C++11? So we can basically do the exact same code that we did with RCPP and then try it. And what um, C++11 CPP 11 is doing under the hood is basically this. So we're, we're calling RF translate car UTF-8 to translate the data into UTF-8 before we pass it to our string. And then we're just doing a little bit of bookkeeping to um, make sure we don't have any memory leaks. So by default, this RF translate car UTF-8 um, function will uses a, a different type of um, protection in the in the R API that only releases the memory when after the dot call um, barrier has returned. And if your C++ library is doing a bunch of of work, this this could mean that that memory won't be freed until your dot call returns. So um, so using these Vmax get and Vmax set allows us to avoid that potential like sort of mini memory leak. And then we can pass our string to our API to do whatever um, things we want to do. And then if we're getting data from an API, we, we can store that in a standard string. And then the important thing is that we use this, this function make car len CE. And this allows us to mark the, the string as UTF-8 data before we pass it back to R. And doing these two things with the same example, we can see that we get sort of what we would hope for to begin with. So if it's a Latin one string, internally this gets converted to UTF-8 by CPP-11, and then returned as, a, as the UTF-8 equivalent of this Latin one in, input, and we get our proper um, facile result. 
And then again, if we if we have UTF-8, uh, UTF-8 string, we get again, again the same result on, on Windows. So that um, shows that this, this approach does work for real examples. So the last thing, let me just check my time. All right, the last thing, um, the last big idea that CPP11 gives us is support for alt-rep. So alt-rep stands for alternative representation. It was first, re uh, first released in R 3.5 and up. And each new release of R has sort of increased the scope of, of things use, that use alt-rep internally. So the idea of alt-rep is that a normal R vector always has its, its data directly with the sort of the, the metadata of the vector. So the, the, inside the metadata, there's the length and, and a pointer to the, the actual data. And historically, a regular R vector always has all of the actual data values um, stored right alongside the, the rest of the data. The idea of alt-rep is that data doesn't actually have to be stored by the, the rest of the metadata. And that data doesn't have to exist at all. It could actually be completely generated data that's just sort of generated on the fly, or it could be pulled from an external data source like a, like a database or, um, or a file. And so these alt-rep vectors are, have, are being used in right now in a few places. But as I said, each new version of R sort of has uses um, alt-rep in, in more places. And then it can also be used in packages. So one example of a package that uses alt-rep extensively is one of my packages, the Vroom, Vroom package. And so this package um, lets us do lazy loading of CSV and TSV files um, from disk on demand. So rather than um, having to read the entire data up front, um, you only read the data as you need it, um, as you actually as your code is actually using it. And it does this um, completely transparently to the user using these alt-rep vectors. And if you want to learn more uh, about the Vroom package or about alt-rep, I go into more detail in the talks. I have a talk from Usar um, on, on Vroom. So that, that's where I would go. You can get to it either on the Vroom website or on jimhester.com. So we, Regular R functions are automatically alt-rep aware. So if we try our original sum vec function that we, we did uh, earlier in the talk, and here we're going to give it um, 10,000 values and then sum them up. And then if we inspect our, our vector that, that we return, our original vector, we can tell that it's an alt-rep vector. And, and we can tell that because this says compact here and then the number of bytes in this vector is only 680. And so there's no way that you could store 10,000 values in only 680 bytes. And so actually this, this colon operator is automatically creating an alt-rep vector for us uh, in base R. And what this, this alt-rep vector does is basically generates the values of this, this range on the fly. So you don't actually have to store 10,000 values. You, you just generate a new value every time you index into this. And so this is really useful for, um, because we don't have to, if we, we could have 10 billion value, values in this range and we wouldn't have to store 10 billion values in memory. We could have a, a for loop that does that many um, values without a problem using these alt-rep vectors. So if you try to pass one of the this this same alt-rep vector to an RCPP function, again, this is the same RCPP function we showed earlier, we see an interesting thing happen. So here just above my head, we see this is not now compact, it's now expanded. And now if we look at the size of our vector, it's much bigger because what actually happened is that instead of being a regular um, compact alt-rep vector, this is now expanded to all of the the data within that range is now living in memory. And that's why the object size is so much bigger because we are actually storing 10,000 um, four byte values. So why does this RCPP code um, cause this to happen? So it's actually 
due to this integer vector constructor. So it might be more clear if we look at the equivalent C code um, for this. So again, this C code shows us the same behavior we saw in RCVP. It's expanded and our size is much bigger. And that's because this C code is using this integer macro. And this integer macro will automatically expand any alt-wrap vector to, to have all of its data in memory. So this is a useful feature because often this is a useful feature for backwards compatibility reasons. So, um, so, so we don't want we want these alt-wrap vectors to behave transparently to to user code, and this allows us this integer will will let us treat the alt-wrap vector exactly in the same way. So, what's our alternative to this? So you can see here. This is not expanding the vector, and we're using this integer ELT macro instead. So the nice thing about uh, so this allows us to avoid expanding the alt-wrap vector, but the downside is that integer integer ELT has overhead compared to the integer um, macro, and we have to call this integer ELT function each time in our loop. Fortunately, there's an yet another interface that also preserves the alt-wrap vector integer get region. However, this adds a bunch of boilerplate that we have to go through. So integer get region actually, instead of getting a single value, gets a, a group of values. And th in this case, I'm doing 10 to 100, uh, 1,024 values and pulling them in one call. And that gives us some nice performance benefits. So in the first case, we our performance is, little, is a little worse because we have to expand the, the generated um, range. In the second case, our performance is bad because we're repeatedly calling this integer ELT function. And then in the last case, we get the best performance. So what's the pit bowl of success for, for this case? Um, so basically, CPP11 automatically uses the correct interface for, for regular. So it uses that integer interface for regular vectors non alt rep vectors, and it uses the integer get region interface for alt rep vectors, and it does this automatically for you. So we have this integers um, function. We just pass it like we would. We treat it normally, and it automatically will handle alt rep vectors for us. So that was CPP 11. There were four big things. The correct semantics, safety, memory safety, um, Unicode awareness and support, and support for these alt rep vectors and a bunch of other things. You can learn more at cpp11.rlib.org, and hopefully I have time for a question or two. Thank you. Awesome, excellent job, Jim. Um, we Obviously you are uh, thinking very deeply about, the, about R and uh, optimizing you know, certain features of it. So we really appreciate having uh, members like you in our community and, you know, folks like you, uh, you know, who, who are working on these really important problems that make our lives easier. Um, so very quickly, um, I, I just want to ask a question. And um, my question kind of is related to package developers that are already using our CPP. Um, <clears throat> what, what would the transition like be to using like C, uh, CPP 11? And would that be like a heavy lift lift over or is it unnecessary for, you know, people to be thinking about that? I just want to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, so, in so in terms of the transition uh, mechanics, there is a transition vignette in the RCPP package. So that's that would be a place to look. But in terms of whether you actually have to convert a, um, a package using RCPP to CPP 11, I'd say it's definitely a trade-off. So I don't think it, it would be appropriate for every package to necessarily convert because there is um, some, you have to do, it's not like always a, a perfectly one-to-one -one conversion. You have to think about these writable and readable um, classes. And there's, like, like I said, there's some features in RCPP that just aren't available in CPP 11. So I don't think it's necessarily something that if you have code working um, in a package that uses RCVP, I don't think you have to go out today and change. Um, but if you are interested in some of the, the big things I talked about, like having these correct semantics, the memory safety or Unicode support or support for alt rep, that's when I think it starts to make more sense um, to convert 
convert um, packages. But I definitely don't think every package using RCPP needs to, to do this conversion. Oh, I Sorry, I, I, excellent. So and very quickly, um, our Slido question, our top question was asking, um, C plus plus twenty brings a lot of exciting features to the language. Are, uh, would you ever be thinking about creating a package surrounding those features? Yeah. So the the first thing is that um, you definitely can use C plus plus eleven, seventeen, fourteen, seventeen, and twenty features with CPP eleven. Um, there's no reason just because it there's no reason you can't use those additional features in your R package today. Um, and in terms of if we would ever create a CPP 20 package, I think that's possible, but um, it, it's not gonna be for at least like five or, or more years. Like it, we, we were like hesitant to do C, C++ 11 support today, just because the co people are using so, so many older compilers in many cases that don't, don't have support for these newer language features. So, um, if a CPP 20 package ever happens, it's not going to be for quite a while. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jim. We appreciate your time. Um, we're going to uh, move on to our next speaker here.